our first ministry is prayer. Can you believe that? I could take you to 5,000 pastors' wives, hear the preacher, that will tell you, my husband doesn't pray. Did anybody catch that? I could, I could take you to pastor's wives and they will tell you, my husband don't pray. You'll see him on Sunday. He can read everybody's email in the Holy Ghost. But she will tell you, he don't pray. So you tell me and, and answer this yourself. What more would he have been able to do? If he was that graced by the grace of the Holy Ghost to be able to move like that in the Holy Ghost, what would have happened if he'd have been a praying man? Hallelujah. Let's start reading. Psalms 143. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplication. In your faithfulness, answer me. What does faithfulness mean? Making what you say a reality. So David is saying, God, hear my prayer according to everything you said. He said, God, hear my prayer according to everything you say, and you make it turn into reality. So when David said, hear my request according to your faithfulness. Hallelujah. You can say you're faithful, but only your actions will prove it. And this is what David was saying. Oh, Lord, answer my prayer according to your faithfulness. Answer me. And in your righteousness, do not enter into judgment with your servant. For in your sight, no one living is righteous. That means the universalness of sin. Until they receive the righteousness of Jesus. Until they receive the blood of Jesus. Now we are considered righteous because we have been given righteousness by Jesus. Verse 3. For the enemy has presented, has persecuted my soul. See, he, he's telling you his reason now. Oh, he's persecuting my soul. He's attacking me. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you done got attacked already this morning. You got attacked when you woke up. You got attacked by a text. You got attacked by a phone call. You got attacked driving here. You got attacked by your flesh, by the world, and by Satan. And David was saying the remedy of that is God, answer me according to your faithfulness because the enemy is attacking my soul. Did he say soul? Now notice. That means my mind, my will, and my emotions, right? So even if you didn't see the attack, it could be an inner one. It's one on the inside. He keeps trying to make you feel fear. He keeps trying to make you sweat and try to make you feel anxiety and trying to give you an unnecessary pressure, trying to just cause you to feel this thing and nothing even happened, but all of a sudden, you just, it just comes out of the air sometimes. And that means that my soul is, is attached to the world like our soul is. That our soul is attached to the world. And that's why we are considered to be sensual people. That means we are quick to respond to our five senses. Uh -huh. But when you become a believer, now you want to respond to your spirit. From his spirit to my spirit. From God's spirit to my spirit. And my soul is over there now no longer in control. Tell somebody my soul ain't in control anymore. I don't even know why I'm listening to it that much. Everybody catch that? I don't even know why I'm listening to it that much. 
It should be behind my spirit. And then my body is behind the soul. The body will follow your spirit or your soul. But you got to know which one is which. Hallelujah. Let's go a little further before we start praying. And pray and pray for some folks in Jesus' name. Let's go further, he said. For the enemy has did what? Persecuted my soul. You know what's so powerful about this? Most times we don't know what the enemies of the soul are. We don't know what the enemies of the soul are. There are many enemies of the soul. There are many dangers in the way. This is why the Bible tells us be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Oh, you can't do that unless you get in the prayer and stay in the prayer because prayer will loose your mind. Because our mind cannot understand the things of God. The Bible says the carnal mind cannot comprehend the things of God. But if I will pray, it will give me an interest in them. Did everybody catch that? And so I won't need no psychiatry medicine. I won't need to be stressed out. I won't no, because I start praying and God loose my mind and loose the pressure of that stuff off of me. And now I can hear more in the spirit. Hallelujah. Oh God, will you help me right now? Loose our mind, God, right now. Lord, you're higher than our mind. That's why we could pray higher than we could think. Sometimes thinking too much will wear you out. That's why the, the writer in the scripture says, I'm like a winged child. These things are too high for me. It, it, it caused me too much pressure to keep trying to think on those things. No, all I'm going to do is keep my spirit in prayer and keep listening to the Lord and talking to God about this thing. <laughs> he said, they're persecuting my soul. The enemy of my soul, you got to know who the enemies of your soul are. My God, watch this. He has crushed my life to the ground. Verse 3. He has made me dwell in darkness like those who have long been dead. He made me feel like I was dead. Why? The enemies of your soul will try and make you feel like you're dead. And David was like, verse 4, Therefore, my spirit is overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is distressed. That means it is despondent. This is important. When you find yourself being despondent, then it's hard to respond to God's spirit. This is important. You don't want to be despondent because you will miss the Holy Ghost when they bring you to help. The Holy Ghost came to help, but you were so despondent, you didn't get in the car with Jesus. Amen. So he was saying, watch out for despondentness. Don't, don't let despondentness drag you to depression. Because that's not the life of the believer. That can happen as a result of too much anxiety, too much pressure from the enemy. That you're just letting him do it. But you better go to the Lord and say, God, the enemies of my soul are persecuting me. Let's go. Hallelujah. My heart within me is distressed. I mean, it's despondent. It's hard for me to respond back to your love. This is why sometimes it's hard to get out of that thing because it's hard to respond back to his love. Because it's his love and kindness that have drawn us. And he's trying to draw you out of despondency. So that when you're out, you'll know because then you'll start doing what he said. You'll feel the Holy Ghost move on you and say this. He'll say, do this. Read this. Pray. Get in this word. Contact so-and-so. See if they need anything. Uh, go buy so-and-so some groceries. Go check on them. Call on them. See, I, you see, now I'm responding back to the Holy Ghost. And I'm not just sitting in darkness. I'm not just sitting in despondency. Hello? All right. Let's go a little further. Verse 5. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your miracles. Hello? Have you ever took time to just meditate on his miracles? Yeah. I, I, I meditate on his miracles. Instead of meditating on the mess, 
meditate on the miracle. This is what David is saying. He said, I meditate on the miracle. Hallelujah. I meditate on how many he's done. How many I've read about. Will you help me right now, God? Oh, we got to go a little further. He said, I muse on the work of your hands. Wait a minute. Did you see what it said? I muse. Do you know that's where they got the word music from? In the Greek, they have all these muse. This is where they get the word music from. It means to entertain. So David is saying, I have a remedy for despondentness. I have a remedy for anxiety. I have a remedy. And he's saying, I'll entertain myself with your memory. Hello? He said, I will entertain myself with your mighty works and your mighty acts. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, don't let him. Don't let the enemy stop. Him. Let's go. I muse on the work of your hands. I spread out my hands to you. What is he doing? What is he doing when he said, I spread out my hands to you? Yeah, you see what he's doing? He's like, Lord, I'm ignoring the devil. I'm ignoring my problems. I'm ignoring the anxiety. He said, but I spread out my hands to you and I entertain myself with everything I know you do. <laughs> oh, you've been so good to us, Lord. Thank you, Father. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Why don't you just pray for a moment? Let's pray. Hallelujah. We, somebody needs prayer in here. <laughs> Somebody needs prayer here concerning this thing. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Father God, we're praying right now huh, that somebody would be able to say, you know what, God, huh, instead of focusing on the persecution, huh, but I'm going to focus on your faithfulness. Huh. Like David said in this psalm right here, he said, I stretch out my hands to you. Huh. Oh, I ignore what they're putting up against me. Huh, and I'm looking at all the miracles. Huh. I amuse myself. Huh. I take your miracles as music to my soul. Huh. I take all your wonderful works. Huh. How you turn the water in the wine. Huh. How you fed the 5,000 with fishes and loaves. Huh. Lord, how you healed the paralytic man. Huh. How you brought this person back to life. Huh. How you raised up folks, Lord. Huh. I entertain myself with that. Huh. So I will come out of despondency. Huh. So I will come out of any irregularities of my soul. Huh. So I will come out of persecution. Huh. God is saying, I'm giving you a way out of persecution. Huh. And it's not music, but it's the music yourself on my work. Woo! My God, why don't you thank the Lord for a minute? Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, God, for giving us the, the answer to boredom. So you can't say you're bored in the Holy Ghost. It's impossible. You can never say you're bored in Jesus. It's just that you don't know what to put your mind on. Because David said right here, I music myself. No wonder he wrote songs. Because he learned to think about everything he reads about what God did good and turned it into music. Woo! We just read it. I dare you. We, do you know today the church is supposed to be writing new songs more than ever? We're supposed to be writing new songs. He said, sing unto him a new song. We supposed to, because there's something, when we think about all that he has done, we should be able to find something to rejoice on. We should be able to find something to pull me out of despondency. And now I'm ready to respond to the Spirit of God. And he'll say, you know what, I know, but sing a song right now. Well, God, I, feel, I don't feel like it. We walk by faith and not by feelings anyway. <laughs> and, and just make yourself sing a song <laughs> and say, because back in the day, when they wanted to come out of despondency, they would say, Saul has killed thousands, but David has killed 10,000. Saul has killed thousands, but David, they turned it into a song. They were walking through the city and they created a song saying, oh yeah, David has killed 10,000. Saul has killed thousands, but David has killed 10,000. That was a song. When they were fighting an enemy and the enemy was winning. And then they called on somebody that knew how to entertain themselves in God. That's why when David came up on Goliath, he said, why are you all trembling and afraid? He said, do you know, why are we letting him talk about our God? 
And he said, let's kill this giant. Sometimes we got to kill the giant of anxiety and despondentness and the things that will try and get you to, to persecute you. The Bible, he said, persecutes my soul. No, he said, I amuse myself with all God's miracles. So I mean, I will instantly write a song and say, God has defeated my enemy. God's not going to let me stay in a dark place. God's not going to let me walk around in life full of temptations, thinking there's a demon behind every rock. That's not life. And life more abundantly. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Will you help us? He said, I spread out my hands to you. My soul longs for you like a thirsty land. And then it says, Selah. That means take a break and think on that for a while. My soul is thirsty. Why? Because it's been under persecution for a long time. And now it's thirsty to get from up under persecution. You need to tell the devil right now, you're not going to keep me down. You're not going to hold me down. You're not going to wear me down. You're not going to have me stressed out like everybody else in the world. Everybody else in the world is all stressed out. They're worrying about what's going to happen at the White House, the Black House, the Yellow House, the Green House. I don't know about any of that stuff. I just write a song about God. And I say, David has killed 10,000. Saul has killed thousands. And then I'll keep making up songs. I'll be like, Lord, I love how you turn the water into wine. Oh, Lord, I love how you told them to cast your net on this side of the water. So because there was nothing here. But if I would have been despondent because there was nothing here, I would have never heard Jesus say, cast your net on the other side. Because if, when you're despondent, you can't hear the direction of the next miracle. And he's sending them our way. Tell somebody, I'm in the middle of a miracle right now. You're in the middle of a miracle right now. I promise you. Can I tell you a true story? When we first came to Oakland to start the church, I sold my company, but I didn't have a buyer for the company. But the Lord said, put in your 30-day notice to the landlord and just say your company is for sale. I never ran an ad. I never put it on Craigslist. I never put it in the paper. I never did anything. I just put in the 30-day notice and I said my company is for sale. Ask my wife, true story. The Lord comforted me that morning once it was about five days away from the 30-day notice. We hadn't even packed up the furniture yet. And I was laying in the bed, and I looked at this mighty woman of God over there, and I said, I sure better know what I'm talking about. Because that lady right there, she ain't going to go for it. Uh, brother, I thought the Lord told us to do a 30-day note. And, 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 and the Lord said, don't worry about it, because you're in the middle of a miracle. I heard him. A few days later, a family, a very wealthy family in the church heard about the company being for sale. My God. And they said, how fast can you bring me the bank statements of your company so I can see how much you make? I said, I, 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 could, probably, I, I could probably have them over there tomorrow. I, I, I could probably have them over there to you tomorrow. And then they, they was like, okay, get them over here to me tomorrow. I, I never told that man our company was for sale. I ran those papers over there to him. And they, and uh, uh, the wife is a lawyer, so you know, they, they, they chopped them papers up, boy. And, but I heard the Lord tell me, you're in the middle of a miracle. God's sending you to Oakland to start a church. So he was like, think on that. Why don't you make music on that, the Lord was saying. He said, think on these things. Whatsoever is pure, whatsoever is lovely, whatsoever is honest, whatsoever is of power or virtue. He said, think on this. So I said, wife, we're in the middle of a miracle. They called me the next day. I took them the papers. They looked at them and said, okay, I'll offer you this. And then I was like, well, that sure is enough to move. In my mind, I was like, that, that, that is enough. I said, but you know what? I was thinking more like this. 
Tell them to always hit them with a counter off. <laughs> Tell somebody hit them with a counter off. Uh, hit them with a counter offer, Brother David. When they hit you with an offer, say, well, you know, that ain't bad. But I was thinking of more like this. Why? Because we serve a big God. And, and, man, and I, I focus on his faithfulness, like David said. And so when they came and hit me with the offer, and, and, and you know, something inside of me was like, well, don't scare them away. And the Lord was like, don't be afraid. You're in the middle of a miracle. And I said, I'm willing to try anything. I said, what about this? <laughs> and then the guy came back, and then he was like, well, you know, this is, let me talk to my wife. This is my final offer. And he went up. Tell somebody, they'll go up. <laughs> because if you're in the middle of a miracle, it's going to go up. Tell somebody, my stock just went up. My, my personal stock in myself, my personal value that God has in me, because he said I'm a treasure, I'm a masterpiece, my personal stock just went up in God. Hallelujah. So that's why I don't settle for, 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 for them cheap $2 brothers coming up and sisters coming to y'all with them $5 pair of shoes on. Trying to act like he's a hundred dollar pair. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Watch out for that stuff. Say, no, my stock just went up. I'm a masterpiece in Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. I tell my daughter on a regular basis, you are a masterpiece. So she don't need no one to tell her she's a masterpiece. I tell her on a regular basis, you're a masterpiece. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And you were created to do good, not created to give yourself to them, and now you ain't doing anything. No, no, no. You were created to do good. That's why he created you. So if that means you got to be by yourself, then be by yourself. Hello? Even if it means for a while. Hallelujah. Jesus' name, because sometimes you get involved with people and then all your good that went out the window. <laughs> you used to do good, but <laughs> now you're doing bad. No, I was created to do good. Jesus' name, my stock just went up. Hallelujah. The man turned around, bought the company within five days of our 30 day notice running out. And he came in my house and gave me that big old check. I said, I said, Lord. And then look, and then me and my wife, we had to hurry up, rent a U-Haul, fill up the U-Haul. We didn't have a place to live in Oakland. And we ran and started searching for a place. And then we looked over here, we looked in Concord, we looked over here, we put in applications and then and then asked my wife. We had to live in the out the U-Haul in a motel for three days with all our stuff in it. So we didn't have nowhere to go. But we had a pocket full of money. And we were in the middle of a miracle. And God was saying, come to open and start a church. I said, okay. Here we are. Tell somebody, focus on the miracles. And you are in the middle of one. I'm in the middle of one. That's what you got to have in your spirit. I'm in the middle of one. And, and since I'm this far into this, and though this wasn't even the message, now I'm going to give you the message real brief. Let's go to John chapter... Hallelujah. Let's go on and get into the message briefly. I, I, I can't wait any longer. Let's go to John chapter 6. And then we'll go to John chapter 4. Is that okay? Hallelujah. Let's go there. I'm going to show you something, church. John chapter 6. It's amazing. Thank you for helping us today, God. In Jesus' name. Thank you for helping us. Hallelujah. Oh my God. And it may even be John. It's John 5, church. And if from there, we will go to the next chapter. John chapter 5. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. 
and now it's in Jerusalem by the sheep gate, a pool. Tell somebody a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay at this pool a great multitude of sick people, of blind people, of lame people, of paralyzed people. What? Waiting for the moving of the water. They're waiting to get into a miracle. And you and I are in a miracle, and they're waiting to get in one. You and I are in a miracle, but they're sitting there waiting to get in one. But we are in one right now. I'm telling you, let's go. Verse 4. For an angel went down and touched a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of what? Of whatever problem, disease, sickness, ailment they had. Verse 5. Tell somebody, now a certain man. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity. He had an illness. He had a sickness. My God. 38 years when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that what? He had already been in that condition for 38 years. He said to him, do you want to be made whole? That word well is whole. Do you want to be made whole? Can I tell you something, church? I want to speak to you today concerning this. What excites your compassion? What excites your compassion? Let's pray. Father God, we bless and honor you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, we see, God, you are at work again in the story. It's very familiar. Everyone knows it, even all over the world, God. It's in John. Oh, Lord, where you at the pool of Bethesda. You were going up on your way to complete your purpose uh, on your way up uh, to die on the cross for humanity and for salvation sake God uh, Lord that we could be brought back to you uh, that Lord we could take part in this great inheritance uh, that we could receive you as our portion Lord uh, but you had to make a stop oh Lord uh, on your way to die on the cross uh, you said I must need go here uh, another story you went to see the woman at Samaria uh, you said I must need go to Samaria uh, I cannot just pass by this place. And there's something about Bethesda and this pool where the people were praying, where there was a need at. And Jesus said, I just can't walk by it. I must stop right here and see about somebody. Oh, but there was a lot of folks there sick. But there was something he saw in this one man. He said, I must stop there. I cannot pass it by. Will you help us understand it today? In Jesus' name. Why don't you thank the Lord for a minute, Lord, church, and bless him and honor him. What excites your compassion? We know compassion is similar to passion, but it's not the same. Passion is good. I believe when Jesus died on the cross, it wasn't passion that put him there, but it was compassion. I know they made a movie that said, the passion of the Christ, but I have seen passion turn into murder. Passion doesn't always turn into compassion. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Passion doesn't always turn into compassion. When Jesus saw the multitude somewhere else, it said he looked and he was moved with not passion, compassion. He was moved with something that would cause him to move toward it. He was moved with something that was causing him to say, there is a need. This is us, church. This is the church today. We are people that are supposed to be moved not just by passion. It's good to have passion. But passion, as we learn from anger, is also associated with anger to a point where passion can cause you to kill a person. That's why they're called crimes of passion. But I want to know, what is it that excites my compassion? That's what I'm more interested in. What excites my compassion? 
Passion, there are a lot of passions out there. There's passion to complete a degree. Passion to make it on a sports team. Passion to, to go do this. Passion to do this. Prostitutes have passion. They certainly aren't working in compassion because that's somebody else's husband. So if you ask me which one I want, I pray my passion will lead me to compassion. What excites my compassion? I want it to be the same thing that excited Jesus' compassion. Yes. We learn in the story that he's going by the pool of Bethesda. And he saw all of these people there. He saw, the Bible says, the lame, the halt, the weak, those with diseases, those with all these conditions, but one man called Jesus' attention. There were many sick people there. Don't something inside of you want to know? I didn't kill him. He wasn't the only one that had been there for a long time. His people have been there for years. But there was something about this man's need. Tell somebody. Mercy was designed for need. Mercy was designed for needs. Jesus is the incarnation or the incarnate, meaning divinity and humanity mix of mercy. Hallelujah. The Bible says it's great in mercy, rich in mercy. The Bible tells us that what flows from the throne of God is grace, grace and mercy. It proceeds from the throne along with justice. Those three things you will always find at the throne of God. So that's why when you get there, that's why when you took them, the priest and said, come into the Holy of Holies, I want you to come into the mercy seat. He didn't put a grace seat back there. He didn't put a judgment seat there. He turned the judgment seat into a mercy seat. And who remembers what happens when you get close to mercy and you don't get mercy? There's a word called Mered. Mered is close to mercy, but you didn't get it. Mered means Satan still fights. That's what it means in the Greek. Satan still fights. And so if you find yourself looking for mercy, and you walk away, and it's still fighting you, you didn't get mercy. Don't leave the altar until you get mercy. Don't leave the altar until you get mercy. And it was something about this man that mercy was moved by him. Not all the other people, but by him. And mercy went to him and said, do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be made well? He was not talking about healed from a disease. You remember I preached this when he asked the man that. He wasn't talking about, do you want to just be physically made well? He was saying, do you want to be whole with God, whole with yourself, and whole with others? Amen. Those three things must accompany being whole. Yeah. If you obtain mercy, you should give mercy. Amen. If you don't give mercy, you're not getting it back. And he was there with this man. And it was, it was something that drew him to him. And he said, I want you to know, do you want to be made whole? Let's look at what else he said to him. Do you want to be made whole? Hallelujah. Oh, God. The sick man answered, verse 7, him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I was coming, another stepped down before me. Again, too focused on what everyone else is doing. Too focused. But if the man would have kept his focus and just stayed on the Lord, not on man. Verse 8, Jesus said unto him, what? Rise, take up your bed and walk. The truth is, he was saying, it's been time for you to walk. 
it's been time for you to get up. All you have to do is come in contact with true mercy. All you got to do is come in contact with the direction that mercy offers you. Verse 9. And immediately the man was made well. He was made whole. Took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. We know that the man got up. He walked. And things was changed for his life. Now let's go to the woman at Samaria. Which I want to read for you. Go to the woman at Samaria. Hallelujah. Turn with me to. Is it in John chapter 4? Let's go there. John chapter 4. Watch what he says to her. This is important. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples did. He left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed what? Why did he need? He needed to go to Samaria because there was a need. And since he's the epitome of mercy, nothing excites his compassion like a need. What excites your compassion, church? We are all human here. We all know what could get our passions burning. We all know what could move our passion and what we could get passionate about. But in Christ, the Lord is saying, what excites your compassion? Let that be at the brink, at the tip of your spirit all the time. Lord, I want, I, 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 I want my compassion to be excited. Oh, it's easy to get our passions excited from everything from Pepsi to prostitutes. I mean, if you look everywhere, you'll see a lot of things get people excited. Hamburgers, houses, clothes, shoes, there's a lot of things. But the Lord is saying, that, that right there is just passion. What excites your compassion? What would make you to give almost everything you got to go take groceries to somebody around the world? What would make you do that? And not passion? It's compassion. That's why I said, Jesus looked upon him and he wept. So inside of Jesus' spirit, when he was walking, he came to Samaria and he's like, I gotta stop by Samaria. Why? There is a compassion pulling at me. There was something exciting in his compassion. That's what you and I, that's who we are. We are people that something must always, something must always be clawing at us. Something must always be digging at us. Uh, and that is the need of somebody. That is the need of somewhere, somewhere around the world, somewhere locally, somewhere on our street, somewhere in our neighborhood, that, that the, 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 the passion, the need of somebody else is clawing at me. That excites me more than my own passion. Jesus teaches us this. That's why he said he was moved with compassion. Hallelujah. And sometimes you ain't gonna get a lot of people that's moved by compassion. But guess what? Just take who's gonna go with you. Just take the ones that's gonna go with you and forget about the rest. I promise you, I can never pastor a church of 100 people. I already know that will slow down my compassion. Did somebody hear that? I doubt even if it'll get to 50. It'll slow down my compassion. My compassion is calling me. Somebody's need is calling me somewhere. Somebody, I must need go. I want to pray for you right now that God will put up. I must need go. I must need go in your spirit. God put it in your people's spirit. You said they that are among us are those who have turned their world upside down. Jesus, you only took 12 and you began to feed 5,000 out of 
compassion, not out of passion. Lord, you died for the entire world and earth, not just out of passion, but out of compassion. You saw that they were lost, and you see that people are lost. You came to save that which was lost, Lord. You came not to those that have no need of a physician, but your compassion was always excited. Whatever you saw, there was a need. God, let us be the people that's always excited by the need of others. Oh, be it in our family, be it by strangers. Oh, Lord, help us to be kind to one another. Help us even, Lord, to entertain strangers. For they may have been in the presence of angels, unaware. God, I pray, Lord, that my compassion is ready to stop by Samaria, ready to stop by wherever there is a need, and the need is blinking. The man's need was blinking. It was blinking in Bethesda. It was like a yellow light. It was flashing at Jesus, and it kept saying, Jesus, slow down, slow down and stop right here. I know there's a lot of people that sick, but there was one man's need that was greater. Huh. Oh, will you stir us up today? You stopped by the well and you saw this woman and you said to the woman, I see this need. He said, I must stop by Samaria. And yes, Jesus was thirsty. And he asked the woman for some water, but he was more thirsty for her need than he was for water. That's why he directed it toward her. And she said, what are you doing talking to us? Aren't you a Jew? You don't even have anything to do with the Samaritans. Uh, but little did she know, uh, mercy uh, was standing right in her face. Uh, and mercy was saying, you have need of me. Uh, oh, uh, you have need of me. Uh, oh, can I tell you something right now, church? Uh, watch this, please. Oh, Holy Ghost, please let me go. Please let me explain it right. Uh, I want to show you something. Uh, he passed through the city. Verse 7 of John chapter 4. The woman of Samaria came to draw. Jesus said unto her, give me a drink. He said it out of her need for compassion. She thought it was out of thirst, but it was out of her need for compassion. Verse eight, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For the Jews, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. They had no compassion. Can we see it? It said they had no dealings with us. No compassion. Let's go. Verse 10. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink. You would have asked him, and he would have given you what? Living water. Ha, my God. Living water to make you well, to make you whole. Because you were not, let's go, you were in need of mercy. Verse 11. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with. Water is deep. Where then do you have living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock. Jesus answered and said to her, whosoever drink of this water, what? Will not be satisfied. They will still be thirsty. But whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him, never thirst. You will never thirst. You want this water. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Verse 15. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst. She realized her own need now, nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you have now is not your husband. In that space, you truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Here we go. Our fathers worship. Uh-oh. Here we go. Watch this. Verse 20. 
Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. And you do say that Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Now, this is important. Because during this time, they always situated the worship of God and with sacred places until Jesus stepped on the scene. They always situated worshiping God only when if you could get to this place, only if you could get to that building, only if you could get to this particular area, river, or whatever. But watch how he brings in prayer. Can somebody say prayer? Prayer. Watch how he brings it in. What verse? I want to make sure you're paying attention. What verse? Verse 21. Watch this. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me. Here we go. The hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem worship the Father. Stop. Do you see the point? They always only associated worshiping God with going there and going there. But Jesus was telling them there was coming a time that wherever you praying at, Did anybody see that? This is what Jesus was introducing to him. Not only was Jesus introducing it, God was introducing it to the whole dispensation of time. It was saying no more. He said the hour is coming and even now is. Where they're not just going to worship him only when they get to church. This is what he was clarifying. Let's go. You worship, watch three things I want you to see. You worship what you do not know. That's ignorance. He was trying to break down all the ignorance. This is why he said, you worship what you do not know. You don't know how to connect. <laughs> Even when you go there, you ain't been connecting. But tell him. Next, you worship what you do not know. Now watch what he said about the Jews. We know that we worship for salvation is of the Jews. Now he's speaking of a knowledge of something, right? Now watch the third point. But the hour is coming, like he said a few minutes ago, and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit, little s. You see that in your Bible? It should be a little s. Do you see that? That's a little s. That's not a capital S. So he's not talking about Holy Spirit. When it's Holy Spirit, it's a capital S. Do you see the little s? Say yes. Yes. All right. So he said there's coming a time and it is right now when you get ready to learn how to get to the Father. One, because Jesus and the Father were one. He was like, but he's looking for true worshipers that will worship the Father from your spirit, is what that says. And in truth, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. Why? Because God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus answered her, I who speak to you am capital he. I who speak to you am he. I who speak to you am he, and the hour is coming, the hour is coming, he said, the hour is coming to when you ain't going to have to go there to worship him, you're not going to have to go there to worship him, but the hour is coming and all you got to do is get in prayer. 
let your spirit come up and touch him. And that's why he was moved by compassion to go to Samaria. He said, my compassion is stirring me to go to Samaria, not my passion. What excites your compassion, church? I'm asking you today. The Lord is speaking to you today. Why don't you stand with me and let's pray. Hallelujah. Father God, Lord, you're asking us the question. You even asked the woman at the well of Samaria. You said, you said what? You said you worship what you don't even know. He said the Jews worship but they know, but they only worship him in this building and on that mountain and on this place. He said, but the hour is coming and it now is where the true worshipers will know how to connect to him in prayer. Because he said, you will worship him from your spirit and in truth. Jesus, help me to be moved and excited in my compassion more than my passion. When you saw the people at Bethesda, it was only one man that moved you, Jesus. Because out of everybody's need, you saw something about his. And you stepped over everyone else, all the sick people. There were sick people there. But you ignored all of them because there was something about this man's need. Lord, it excited your compassion. It excited your compassion. Lord, let us be people that our compassion gets excited. More than my passion. Passion can cause me to commit a crime, but not compassion. Lord, let compassion spread all over the sanctuary right now. Lord, Lord, we're lifting our hands right now. Lord, let compassion fall on me. Lord, help me, Lord. Because it was compassion that put you on the cross more than it was passion. Oh, passion can cause you to have so much energy and zeal that you will miss the need. But compassion is only stirred because there is a need. Somebody has a need and my compassion is excited. I want you to raise your hands and allow the Lord's compassion to fall on you right now. Your, his compassion for others. Uh, the compassion that caused him to say, on my way to Jerusalem, uh, I got to make one stop. Uh, on my way home, uh, I got to make one stop. Uh, there's somebody that I maybe haven't been compassionate to uh, on this Mother's Day. Uh, there's somebody uh, I might pass by. They might be a wino. Uh, they might be a prostitute, but she might still be a mother. Uh, and she might need some compassion God, excite my compassion like yours was excited. <laughs> so let us be a church full of passionate people, but not compassionate. Release us. Release us, oh Lord, to, to run out, to, to chase after what my compassion is excited about more than my passion. I want you to come and stand with me, church, and we're going to pray. I'm going to pray that a blanket uh, and an umbrella uh, of compassion would fall over this altar right now. God, let a blanket of compassion uh, fall over this altar right now. Uh, let a blanket of compassion fall over it right now. Uh, you're the only one that could do it, Lord. Uh, Lord, I'm praying. Uh, I thank you, Lord. Uh, I know there's something special, God, uh, that you stirred in someone's heart today, Lord. Uh,